pancakes for our lunch. I eat pancakes for our dinner. It's a pancake town in this whole world. I eat a baby pancake. Grab the butter and don't forget the scissor. Pancake analytics is the stat wizard. She clack and he clack and he clack. Pancake, 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 yeah. Pancake, 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 yeah. Hello everyone. So in this video, I'll be going through an article I put up on the site. I'll explain just my thoughts um, and hopefully visualize a concept that I think doesn't really ring true to many. So this video might upset a lot of people, but you know, let's just have a conversation about it. So you can get to it first off on my website, PancakeBreakfastStats.com. And it's titled, Is Sports Card Investing Really Just Entertainment? So you can get it right in that top scroll scroller. Click on Learn More. And it will load the article for you. So let's kick this thing off. Is sports card investing really just entertainment? A uh, 200K budgeting approach revealed. So I want to know, are you as curious uh, as I am on if sports card investing is more about entertainment than profit? What I mean by that is in this article, I'll share with you a pro forma approach for a practical long-term 200K budgeting strategy contrasting the complexities and risks of selling trading cards for profit. I also want you to discover why I feel budgeting a fixed monthly amount might be a smarter and more consistent approach to achieving long-term financial goals while still enjoying the hobby. Right? So this article was crafted on the basis of, you know, a lot of people say, you know, hobby off of the or profit off of the hobby you love, or, you know, flipping cards, investing in cardboard. I want to try to, like, make that real and highlight what that would look like. So what's included in this stack? So first off, I have a section on investing. So section one, what is trading card investing? I'm going to go over the concept of being a trading card investor, or, in other words, a very broad stroke definition of the term. How does this differ from trading card collectors? How does this differ from trading card flippers? And is there any overlap between these three segments? And finally, how is the information provided by myself on my channel and my content, my website? Is that different than investing? The goal here is to educate. Uh, section two, the goal is going to be to inform. So it's just going to be notable trading card investing channels. I'll share some examples of trading card investment channels and their social media imprint as it stands on YouTube and Instagram. I performed a simple YouTube search for trading card investing, and these content creators were my top results. So I just want to call out the contents of this article and case study are not speaking ill to anyone mentioned or featured in this writing. Then we'll dive into a case study, section three, pro forma approach, how to make 200K in trading cards. This approach seeks to provide a reasonable solution to the average hobby participant with intentions of investing. Yeah, be clear there. That's what your your intention has to be or making money off the hobby they love. <laughs> this is not the same approach a business, a hedge fund, or an already wealthy established individual would take. This approach is longer by design and meant to be budget conscious. The goal here is a solution, a solution for the majority average collector getting into this approach. <coughs> Section four, this is a hobby. The goal here is to share and discuss. 
Now that I've shown you a feasible approach to investing in trading cards, let's discuss should this be implemented and what truly is the nature of trading cards. <coughs> I'll share a lot of my thoughts and opinions here. So let's kick it off with section one. What is trading card investing? Well, I'm going to break it down into four different quadrants. I might have gone into five or six, but here's those broad stroke definitions. Investing in trading cards, to me, means buying cards with the intention of holding them long term, hoping they will appreciate in value over time due to factors like player performance, rarity, and demand. An example of this would be purchasing a rookie card of a promising young athlete and holding it for several years, expecting it to rise in value as the player's career progresses. Investing can overlap with collecting, especially when a collector buys cards they also believe will appreciate in value. So I think the key in that example was holding it for several years, expecting it to rise in value. I call that out because most of the channels that popped up in the search are really more day traders, um, in my opinion. And, you know, unless we change the definition of what several years looks like in trading cards, it could be, Seasons, parts of a season. Collecting trading cards involves acquiring cards for personal enjoyment, historical interest, or completing sets, often without a primary focus on future resale value. So an example here, a collector might try to complete a full set of particular series such as all the cards from a specific year of sports league or a particular Pokemon series. Collecting can overlap with investing when the collector also considers the potential value of their, of the cards they collect. Now let's touch on flipping. Uh, flipping trading cards refers to the practice of Buying cards with the intention of quickly reselling them for a profit. This often involves taking advantage of short-term trends or market inefficiencies. So, for example, purchasing a card at a low price from an online auction and immediately reselling it at a higher price on another platform where it is in higher demand. Flipping can overlap when investing, when the time frame for holding the card is short, but the goal is still profit. Uh, it can also intersect with collecting somewhat if the flipper initially buys cards for their collection and later decides to sell them. <laughs> now we'll get to analytics portion, kind of where my role comes into play. So analytics can be supplementary to trading card investing while using data and statistical methods to evaluate the market forecast trends and make informed buying and selling decisions. Example, analyzing past sales data, player performance statistics, and the market trends to predict which cards will increase in value and when to buy or sell. That example you can see right on the landing page of my website. Um, there's a monthly index chart. There is a three-month forecast. All of this is to tell you when is good times to buy and sell. So analytics supports both investing and flipping by providing data-driven insights to inform decisions. Now, collectors may might also use analytics to enhance their collections strategically. That use case I always call out in any case study I do, analytics I do, is that collectors like 
you can use this, you know, if you want to go that route. It's definitely not needed, but it's there at your expense. So let's just go over those roles really quick again. That broad stroke understanding. Uh, each of these activities, you know, they can overlap as collectors might consider future values. Investors might quickly flip cards and can all benefit from analytical insights. So investing, think long-term holding for future profit. Collecting, acquiring for personal enjoyment or set completion. Flipping, quick buying and selling for short-term profit. Analytics using data to inform and optimize trading card decisions. So now that we have those four buckets, that framework, I'm gonna show you some notable trading card investing channels in section two. This is based off of just the search term trading card investing. I have an actual link here to where you can pull up the results of my search. So content creators for trading cards and sports investing, they often focus on the entertainment value of their content, uh, engaging audience with exciting card openings and market speculation. Their charismatic presentations and dramatic reactions can captivate viewers sometimes overshadowing the practical investment advice. While they provide valuable insights, you know, it's essential to approach their content with a balanced perspective. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, recognizing the blend of entertainment and informational content. Below, I'll share with you three examples based on the YouTube search I performed, and let's examine their social imprint and keep in mind those four buckets I talked about and you think about which ones they really should fall into. First off is Sports Card Investor. Um, the YouTube channel Sports Card Investor offers market analysis, investment strategies, and insights into the trading card industry. Now, this could help collectors and investors make informed decisions. Their current YouTube subs as of writing this article was nearly 320K. Uh, they've made over a thousand videos. Their average last three views per video is 13.6K. On Instagram, they have 139 thousand followers sports card invest you know the youtube channel sports card invest provides advice marketing updates and investment strategies for trading card enthusiasts looking to maximize the value of their collections so youtube subs they're almost at 50k YouTube videos, they've made over 500. Their average views per video is 1.8K. Instagram following is nearly 45K. Now we get to the Pokemon TCG. Uh, Poke Beard even has investing written here in his backdrop his thumbnail, his banner. He's made several by these. Are these the top cards to invest in? He does a dedicated video for investing. So, but he also focuses on Pokemon card collecting, offering unboxing reviews and insights is where his investing advice comes into play for enthusiasts and collectors. His YouTube subs are at 121K. He's made nearly 2.5 thousand videos. His average over the last three videos is 7.2K. And his Instagram following is 
point two k. So not a big imprint on Instagram. So tell me again about how to invest in cardboard. So in section three, I'm going to show you a pro forma approach, how to make 200 K in trading cards. And I titled it that way to be as provoking as it sounds. And you'll see, you know, it paints more of a realistic picture of what it takes. This isn't an overnight thing. So here's some considerations I want you to take for this approach. I'm about to show you the tools that we'll use. Uh, we'll utilize eBay for selling trading cards and the Acorns app for automatically investing the proceeds to achieve compound growth. Investment monthly needed to get to that 200K. So we have to commit to a fixed monthly investment of 492 into the Acorns app to leverage compound interest over 20 years and also cover all the fees. <laughs> monthly eBay sales needed to invest that amount. So to generate approximately nearly 9.3k a little bit over in ebay sales each month to ensure sufficient profit after taxes and expenses for the 492k investment you'll see later on i'll break this down into a graded option as well so that cost there is just if we went the raw card route associated cost so we need to account for about 2000 K in monthly inventory cost. Um, let's think about, we'll only get about a two 28% profit margin off of that 9.3 K. And we're also going to have to pay about 20% tax rate when planning your sales and investment strategy, you should be taking this into account. You know, this is where we go beyond the entertainment value. This is real life. So what is a pro forma? Uh, pro forma is a financial projection tool used to estimate future revenues, expenses, and profitability. For sports card collectors, it means creating a detailed financial plan that forecasts how much you need to sell and invest over time to reach your financial goals, such as accumulating, in this case, 200 k through trading card sales and investments. So hopefully this will help you understand the financial requirements and potential outcomes of your business decisions. Because if you're investing in this, you should be acting like you're running a business. This link here will give you to the definition by Investopedia of pro formas. And later on, I'll go into my experience in developing them. Caveats and assumptions. So, you know, I'll share the results with you soon. But first, I want to go into detail more about the why. Why use acorns? So, I'm trying to solve for the broader hobbyist, right? The broader collector. So, for a trading card collector, I think Acorn provides an easy and automated way to turn your passion for trading cards into a significant financial goal. You know, by linking your eBay sales to Acorns, you can effortlessly invest the profits from your card sales into a diverse portfolio. This helps you take advantage of compound interest, steadily growing your investment over time without needing to manage it actively. Acorn simplifies the investment process. Uh, it allows you to focus on collecting and selling cards while ensuring your earnings work towards building a substantial future next stag. So I like the element of like you could link your purchases as well. So when you think of like, hey, buying inventory, you know, it invests the change. Now there are going to be some limitations to Acorn. There are definitely pros and cons. 
Um, you really don't have flexibility into what you're investing into. But when I just think of like the average broader collector hobbyist, you know, we're probably attached to our phones at this point. You know, it's always searching eBay. <laughs> so why do I use eBay? Uh, for a trading card collector, eBay, I feel, is an ideal platform to turn your collection into consistent income. eBay provides a vast marketplace with millions of potential buyers. Ensuring the visibility for your trading cards, it offers tools to track sales, manage inventory, and understand marketing trends, making it easier to sell cards at optimal prices uh, by leveraging eBay's intensive reach and user-friendly features you can efficiently monetize your collection uh, generating the profits needed to invest regularly into acorns and work towards your 200k financial goal one feature of ebay i don't have included in this pro forma modeling is the cost to boost auctions if you want to get more eyes on it you could add this to the data that I have below for you to export if you want to go that route. But in this example, I was assuming we are not going to boost. <coughs> so you'll see I made an assumption on the average price sold. So I set it at $30 average price sold. Just trying to think of like distributions of the cards you would have, whether it be graded or ungraded, sets, parallels. You know, you might lose some on some sales. You might win more on others. So in this Porfoma, I assume an average sold price, $30 per trading card. So the figure is really based on, hey, current market trends, historical data that, hey, that many collectibles cards fall within the price range. Uh, for trading card collectors, this average provides a realistic and obtainable benchmark for sales. So considering various factors such as like card condition, rarity, player pop popularity, are you selling at the right time? Using a $30 average sold price helps ensure the projections are grounded in market realities. Making the financial goals achievable through consistent sales performance. So let me talk about that assumption on the 2K monthly investment. Um, it kind of goes with like, hey, to make money, you need to spend money approach. So this assumes a monthly investment of 2K dedicated to acquiring inventory. So this budget could be used for a mix of individual trading cards, sealed boxes or cases. Uh, sealed boxes can offer the potential for higher returns as they may contain rare or valuable cards while individual cards allow for more targeted acquisitions. By leveraging in both singles and sealed boxes, trading card collectors can diversify their inventory, increasing the likelihood of profitable sales and ensuring a steady supply of attractive items for eBay listings. This balanced approach maximizes opportunities to meet monthly sales targets and support sustainable growth. I don't go into detail which products we're buying in this example, but just so you get an idea, just a lump sum of 2K. So in the grading version, I'm going to throw in grading assumption cost of 8K because in this Proforma, you have to do bulk grading. You have to move a lot of items. So I assume an 8,000 monthly cost all allocated to grading trading cards. Uh, that'll give you over 300 cards come in each sub. Uh, grading cards through professional services like PSA, BGS, or SGC, you know, it enhances their market value by providing a certified assessment of their condition and authenticity. For trading card collectors, this investment in grading can significantly increase the resale value of individual cards, making them more attractive to buyers on platforms like eBay and also thank you repackers here. Grading, however, takes time. 
Uh, depending on the service and demand, it can take at least three months to upwards of a year to receive graded card back. So to maintain a steady flow of inventory for sale, it's essential to have like this rolling inventory system. <laughs> this means continuously selling cards for trading, for grading while selling already graded cards. So the 8K budget allows for a sustainable number of cards to be graded each month, optimizing the inventory for higher sales prices and ensuring a consistent supply of graded cards ready for the market. Therefore, you'll improve your overall profitability. Another call out here should be that if you go the grading route, you need a starting inventory. Um, you will not have you know, the eBay sales for that inventory start. So you almost have to put this performer on a lag somewhat. You cannot do the grading approach right out the gates, is what I'm saying. You need time to accumulate. So I've highlighted, you know, grading cards come with a cost. Is it really needed, though? Uh, grading can introduce significant reoccurring costs, impacting the overall budget and profitability. To address this, you know, I'm also going to introduce a version of the pro forma that excludes grading costs. Without grading cards, cards may sell for lower prices, significantly increasing the total items sold monthly requirement to meet the investment goal. Um, in the version without grading, you know, hey, there's no grading costs, so that knocks off 8K a month in expenses. Uh, increased sales value. This is crucial. Um, more cards need to be sold to achieve the same profit margin since ungraded cards typically sell for lower prices. Higher monthly sales requirement, so the total number items sold each month will need to increase substantially i'm trying to drive this point home twice in a row back to back with you you know because it's lower average price sales so there's going to be parts of this when you see the output or it's you know explain this to me a little bit so i really want you to understand the average monthly growth so when i refer to average monthly growth in the context of this scenario right i'm discussing the average rate at which the value of investment increases each month due to returns uh for this exercise as performa i assumed an annual growth rate of five percent uh which i can then translate into an average monthly growth rate the monthly growth rate is derived from the annual growth rate given the annual growth rate is five percent this means the investment grows by approximately, you know, 0.4167% each month, like very tiny, right? You know, it might seem small, but due to the effect of compounding interest, you know, it plays a crucial role in building significant wealth over a long period of time. This steady growth that even modest Monthly contributions like that 491 can accumulate the substantial amount like 200K given enough time and consistency in contributions. In the scenarios, right, we're going to give it 20 years to get to 200K. That's why this tiny amount compounds over time. Quick thoughts on the impact of monthly growth on investments. And in this specific case, you know, the power of monthly growth really lies in the compounding where the earns returns on both the initial principal and the accumulated returns from the previous periods. So each month, you know, this is going to grow slightly and the next month growth builds on top of the newer higher balance. Hopefully I did not botch that entire explanation. So before we dig into it, you know, I promise you I'm getting there. You know, 
there'll be some challenges you need to consider. If you want to start just gun ho after this video, give it a try. You know, but what I'm showing you here by no means should be taken as like, do this now, nor financial advice. The goal really here is just to illustrate what I feel it takes to actually invest in trading cards for the average individual. Uh, most likely, they are the target of trading card investing contents. And I'm making a huge assumption there on the target audience as who the YouTube algorithm recommends this content to. I want to be crystal clear. I'm making a statement on who the, I'm not making a statement on who the individual content creator nor their company of individual content creator is targeting with their content. Based on my own research and current data, the average personal saving rate in the U.S. is around 3.6% or disposable personal income at the time of writing this article. I'll explain where I'm going there. I'm trying to see if this is actually feasible for most. So while it's possible for some Americans to achieve this savings goal, it would require intentional financial management focus, possibly reducing other expenditures and consistently making savings a priority to meet just alone the 492 monthly investment target. <laughs> There's a couple of challenges specifically around financial feasibility. So think of disposable income and saving habits. Those are your challenges. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Scenario one, raw to graded cards. So first, I'll start off with the raw to graded card scenario. I do want to mention I'm not a financial advisor by trade. I do have years of financial modeling experience, analytics, and finance. You know, sometimes they intersect, but they're not really apples to apples. As well as, you know, hey, I've built pro forma models <laughs> across multiple verticals. From financial services to retail to tele telecom. So, my opinion, a performa should never be used as a substitute for actual results, nor will it one for one cover your specific instance. So, it's not going to speak to you what's in your collection, what's in your inventory, how you like to sell your preferences. It's just a broad view. There will be additional costs and profits I may be missing. Uh, you may have multiple venues to sell card shows, which I feel you should also factor in those travel and setup costs. This pro forma should be used to illustrate what it takes to invest in trading cards. So scenario one, raw to graded cards. Over 20 years, in this scenario, you would spend nearly 1.2 million, 1.92 million on grading feeds alone. This line chart shows the running totals of eBay monthly sales. That's your blue. Your grading cost is purple. Total cost, including that inventory cost, and the amount of items you would have sold over time. It's responsive, right? So let's look at the total items. By the end of this exercise, 20 years, you would have sold over 303K individual graded cards. We can do the same for, let's look at sales. Through eBay, you would have sold over 9 million in revenue. That's really before your profit margin taxes, right? So you're not getting nine million really in your pocket over 20 years. 
Here's those inputs. Here are the math below, just so you understand that investment needed. The sales requirement in this example is 37000 per month. You have to sell over 1.2 cards per month. And as mentioned, there's all our cost input. Let's go to scenario two. Selling only raw singles. In this scenario, let's remove grading out of the equation. Uh, you can make the argument grading is unnecessary cost to profiting off of trading cards. I do want to call out. I do not quantify the research and development cost of identifying which individual raw card will sell for average price points up $30 on eBay, ungraded. You know, that's a lot of research and effort you have to consider as well. And this approach is going to have the same limitations, assumptions, and caveats as scenario one had above. Similar graft. And just so you understand, over 20 years, you would near, need to sell nearly 75,000 individual trading cards. Line chart shows the running totals, um, the ins and outs of this scenario, right? So your sales needed is only going to be about 13K in this scenario because you don't have that graded cost. You're trying to come over. But I'm also assuming you're selling the right cards at the right time, 430 cards per month. If you're selling the, raw the wrong cards to hit that goal, you're going to well exceed the amount you need to sell <laughs> in scenario one. Same costs. Um, here's where I really just highlight you have to sell the right cards. So hopefully that demonstrated the financial feasibility and what it really takes and gets you some eyes on like just the cost of what you're spending over 20 years, right? Um, do you want to call out eBay is not the only solution for making a profit off of trading cards by diversifying methods such as participating in live card breaks, leveraging platforms, you know, like Com C, Golden, using Fanatics Live, you know, collectors and investors can maximize their profitability, reach different segments of trading card market. <laughs> Breaking, right? I'm talking about live stream openings, selling card spots, Com C, buy, sell, store trading cards, Golden Auctions, premium marketplace for high end collectibles. Fanatics Live, live card breaks for collectors, and I'll break down that in the next section about how you actually can leverage it to get inventory as opposed to like selling on the app. <laughs> so a little bit about card breaking, aka breakers. You know, breakers buy sealed boxes or cases, trading cards, and sell spots in live stream openings where participants receive cards from the break. The method is popular because it offers excitement and the chance to obtain rare cards at a fraction of the box cost. That's the perception. Now, I do want to touch on some content out there that is really, it's showing you the ropes of one of these strategies, you know, if you took what sports card radio is applying, do it for 20 years and be consistent, right? It could be just as or more effective than the two strategies I showed with the idea of still taking that money and investing it. So I understand they're not everyone's cup of tea. Uh, their entertainment style, you know, very on the nose. But I don't want you to really lose sight of 
what they're showing you weekly on a live. Sports card radio, in my opinion, you know, they demonstrate an affordable card profit strategy. Sports card radio during their weekly live YouTube stream demonstrates strategy using platforms like check out my cards and golden auctions to buy and sell cards. Uh, they highlight how ComC allows users to buy, sell, and store cards in their warehouse and how that facilitates easier and more efficient transactions. They even show you what they are buying currently and what they're selling it for. Golden Auction, you know, they call out how, hey, it specializes in high-end collectibles, providing a marketplace for premium cards, which you can often yield higher profits. And then they also show like, okay, here is what they feel they bought at a lower price than what it should be. They're showing you that every week in their live format. So I put a link there to their website. You can visit. Little touch on Fanatics. Uh, buying into breaks through Fanatics Live. So I feel by participating in Fanatics Live breaks, collectors can add value to their inventory, uh, potentially at lower cost than buying single cards directly, thus improving you know profit margins when reselling. Fanatics Live provides opportunities to buy cards into breaks where you know collectors can acquire from sealed boxes open during live streams. I feel what's also not touched on is like, hey, if you're looking to like diversify your inventory, add to your collection in areas you don't think you would normally, you know, this is going to be the quickest way. Get into like a team break, find the price point that you're comfortable with, do some research on the set, See what the likelihood you're going to hit inserts in that team is. <laughs> That's how I use it. Now for section four, I just want to touch on some thoughts. You know, this is a hobby. You can take this as the counterpoint, right? So the reasons not to do any of this. So I hope, you know, after going through this exercise, quantifying what it takes to invest in trading cards, You've gained a newfound or reassured uh, reassured your own opinion on trading cards being a hobby <laughs> and the value of solid budgeting. So budgeting a fixed monthly card amount for investments is often more practical than, say, selling trading cards for profit due to the consistency and simplicity it offers. Trading cards are primarily a hobby, and relying on them for profit introduces, by nature, you know, financial risk and unpredictability due to market being just vital, uh, volatile, and the time and effort required. Uh, by budgeting, you can enjoy the hobby without pressure while achieving your financial goals through steady investments. Here's what I want you to consider. Consistency. So setting aside a specific amount each month, you know, it'll ensure steady contribution to your investment, leveraging compound interest rate over time. Simplicity. Uh, managing a budget is straightforward compared to complexities of buying, grading, and selling cards. Let's focus back on that hobby versus investment. Trading cards are primarily a hobby with enjoyment and personal interest driving purchases. So relying on them for consistent profit, you know, it increases that financial risk <laughs> and unpredictability. You know, it's a, it's a luxury. It's a hobby. <coughs> Cards can fluctuate significantly based on trends and player performance, making it difficult to guarantee consistent profits. The market is very volatile. Time and effort. 
And that is a typo by me. Trading cards. Hobby over investment. Just some parting words. So the performers I developed for this article illustrate the significant effort and, you know, really thorough planning required to profit from trading card, reinforcing my belief that this is more of a hobby than a reliable investment. The projection highlights the sustainable, sustainable sales costs and strategic decisions involved in aiming a 200 goal, 200K. This exercise has helped me visualize, you know, the complexities and financial commitments necessary for investing in trading cards. Please note, once again, none of the individuals or companies mentioned are intended to be viewed negatively nor is this a promotion of their pages, content, or services. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me with feedback. You can download both scenarios here. I hope you enjoy this, and dare say, have I influenced you? Almost made the case for like just if you can leave 400 <laughs> budgeted like don't go through the effort and then if you have it you know collect the rest collect what you like so thank you for sitting through that almost at the 50 minute mark but you know i'm going to share more case studies in this way too I might not always just leave it in PowerPoint form. Let's walk it through together. Let's try to make this as close to a Comic-Con setting as we can. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon. Catch you at a convention. Catch you at the National. Bye. Pancake, 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 yeah. Pancake, 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 yeah. I'm the queen of pancakes, yeah. Pancake, 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 pancake is our life. Scissor. Pancake analytics is the stat wizard. She clackety clackety.